I'm going to be recording this. It'll go on YouTube later. Uh, everyone, can everyone hear? Can everyone see? Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, your mic, I'm I'm British mic, Anthony Andy. I don't know if it's just me, but your audio is dropping out a little bit, Ohike. A bit low. Project. You have to project. Okay. No, no. The only thing that I'm, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just for for sound purposes, I'm just gonna mute everyone at at the start, and then I'll mute myself when someone or you guys mute yourselves, and then when you when you want to speak, just unmute yourself. Feel free to interrupt at any time. There is no no problem at all. So um, so the way this is going to work is quite quite simple. Uh, we're going to do we're going to focus on two parts. Uh, the first part is going to be about promoting yourself as an artist, and the second part is going to be about how to make some revenue while this is happening. Again, if you have any questions, any interruptions at any point, you just go in. This is an open discussion. It's an open. Uh, open field, it's, uh, we're here to, to kind of exchange ideas and help each other out and see how we, if I can help you in any way or if Fidas can, or if you guys can help each other as we saw last week, um, that's, that's absolutely perfect. So, um, so yeah, the first thing uh, that I've noticed from everyone's responses, those who are here and those who, are, who aren't yet, is that everyone is, there's the two main things that kept coming up is, uh, how to reach a wider audience, how to promote yourself more, how to get you know, more plays, more streams, more this and that. That's the first focus. And the second one is how to make some money while this is the case around the world at the moment. Um, so my, my feeling, my, not, this is again, it's very subjective. You can choose to, to completely listen to it or completely ignore it, it's your choice. Uh, there's a few, few, th few thoughts I have first. First of all, today in the music industry and in general, I think all the rules have been broken. So there's no, I always insist on the fact that there are no rules of success or no rules of how things work. And the standard way of things that are supposed to happen have suddenly changed. Second of all, each one of you has your own context. And so what, what works for you or what doesn't work for you might work for someone else. Uh, your situation, your music, your everything is different from one another. Uh, when it comes to earning money, it's important to keep in mind that uh, according to certain studies, only 5% of artists worldwide, registered artists worldwide, by registered I mean those who have uh, music on streaming platforms and so on, only 5% of them overall uh, make more than $10,000 a month. So when you think of that, there's 95%, which is the, the large majority, don't make $10,000 a month of the artists who are on all streaming platforms. Another thing to consider when you're trying to release music, whether it's a new single or a new album or whatever, is that on a daily basis, um, the, the example of Spotify comes up where there's 40,000 new songs per day that are uploaded. So when you, when you keep that in mind, um, it comes to the next point, which I really insist on, which is uh, to manage your, your expectations of when you're releasing music and what you're releasing it for. Like if you're releasing a single or an album or whatever, uh, a lot of artists tend to have the, the feeling that they want that, that song to go viral or it has to hit a, a wider audience. But when you have the figure that there's 40,000 new songs on Spotify, so I'm not talking about Deezer or Anhami or Apple or so on, just Spotify, uh, it gives you a, like kind of a scale of, of, um, of the type of uh, audience we're reaching. Hello, Marie, can you hear us? Let's see. Hello, Marie. Can you hear us? Everyone, Cool. Uh, we're just starting up, so um, I'll just continue my, 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 quick, uh, my quick intro, then each one of you can just introduce yourselves. Um, so yeah, that's uh, when, as I said, you just have to manage expectations uh, to start with. That also goes back to another point, which is a lot of the artists tend to have a, a feeling that without a manager or management, they're unable to succeed. 
and um, Firas will tell you firsthand as Mashro Layla what it's like working with a manager and working without a manager. And, um, and with all that's been happening everywhere around the world, we're all faced with the same challenges, with the same opportunities, and uh, we're going to discuss those. So uh, I'm going to leave it up to you guys, just each one quickly in a couple of minutes. Um, just give an introduction to yourself. Uh, Karina, start. Let us know what your project is. Tell us your name, your project, and let's, uh, let's go for a couple of minutes each, each person. Okay. Hello, everyone. So my name is Karina. I kind of go by the name Karina Lirik with, uh, for my artist name. I do uh, mystic folk music. Um, how it all started is uh, actually last time I didn't say my, my entire story is uh, that I went to India when I was like 17 and before that um, I was in the conservatoire and I was studying piano and I always had this urge to be able to compose you know like Beethoven, Chopin and all these greats and I never could and my father in my home he used to play piano by ear so it always triggered me that I want, I want it, I want it. So I closed the piano and then for 15 years I didn't play. And when I started doing yoga and meditation, suddenly like I started hearing melodies and, and songs and all these things. So that's how I started my journey. And um, yeah, I mean, um, the last time I came from India was 2015 and I was set. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Like, that's it. This is, this is my calling. So that's what I've been doing. Riwa. Hi, I'm Riwa. My musical project is Riwa. <laughs> um, I, uh, I write, I started writing at 15. I'm 20 in June. This is very exciting. My musical journey spanned over um, the space of time. Started writing with um, indie folk music and now trying to go down more R&B jazz influenced work. Um, and at the moment, exploring collaboration across borders. Um, I've been, I met someone that lives in Brazil that we're sending tracks to each other and figuring out how to collaborate online. Marie and I have, I've been exchanging some stuff with her, so she knows. Um, and that's, yeah, that's me and my music. Cool, thank you. Z? You're muted. Hi again. My name is Zikar Kabi. Uh, I'm a music producer. I've been in the field since 99, 2000. Uh, two years ago, I released my first album called, called Is It Time Yet? Uh, I'm preparing another one now. I also have another project called Strip Beirut. We play more electronic uh, light set. Ooh, that's it. Okay, Sandra, you're on mute. You have to unmute yourself at the bottom left. Of the screen. Okay, sorry. Is that fine? Hello. I still see Z. Is that normal? Yeah, yeah, we can all see you. We can all hear you. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm Sandra, and um, my project is called uh, Sand Moon. And I'm releasing my second or third or whatever album tomorrow uh, called Put a Gun Commotion. Um, I, before releasing the album, I released three singles um, because I was told that that's how they do it today because of Spotify and, and being able to, um, when you upload to Spotify, you can only submit one song uh for editorial uh consideration so that's why i guess uh it has changed um you, i guess you'll talk about that uh, later um what else that's it okay by the way uh sandra at the top right of your screen you'll yeah. see the gallery view uh click on that and you'll see everyone at the same time Where's that? I, I see people on the top, but not everyone. Yeah, this, at the top right, you'll see gallery view. If you click there, you'll, you'll uh, can you see it? 
Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you. Gerard. Hello, guys. Um, I'm Gerard Sden. I've uh, been playing music for the past 15 years. I've played with a couple of local bands here in Beirut, like uh, Sandra from San Moon, uh, Hezbet Tareta, uh, a bit with Kinematic. And uh, I've been doing now, I've been drumming with a band called LV, Sampo Stroke. And uh, I've been producing my own uh, material for the past three years. So it's a work in progress. And I've been um, recently uh, co-founded a, a music festival called Sounds Good. And uh, there's a big passion for the local industry in Lebanon for, uh, for me and the co-founder. And being musicians as well is uh, really interesting for us to uh, be around, around this community and to empower each other and to know what, uh, what you all need to have uh, things going on for us so um, that's briefly who I am thank you cool Abel you're on mute okay all right I think I got it hi um, my name is uh, Bea Kadri I'm Lebanese um, I discovered my sound I'd say in uh, London like a bunch of three years ago maybe I went to do masters there and decided to pursue music I just wanted a career in music but then I was like you know what let's not like um, lie to myself. I want to pursue an artist career. So um, I really use R&B and pop music, uh, alternative R&B, future pop. I've released a bunch of singles already. I have an upcoming one in, on June 4th. So that's like my latest, that's about it. <laughs> okay, cool, Marie. Hi, uh, my name is Marie and I go by Melmo. Um, I've been singing my whole life since I was a kid. I went on shows and contests and things like that. And then, um, yeah, as I grew, I started doing like uh, being in bands and doing a cappella and stuff like that. And then I went into uh, engineering and I did my, uh, my bachelor in engineering. And then I decided I wanted to veer back to music. So I did a master's in music in London and I've been, um, writing my songs and producing and um, and I've been working a lot with uh, Zaid Hamdan and some local guys uh, in the scene and that's, that's it, that's me. Okay, cool. Firas, you want to give a quick intro about, about yourself? Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Firas. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Um, I'm a composer and an artist. I've been doing music professionally for 10 years now. Um, with uh, co-founded Mashru Alayla in uh, 2008 and ongoing still and have been getting more and more into um, scoring, film scoring and commissioned projects, um, kind of uh, sound installations and music for VR experiences and just like w weirder things than uh, pop music, I guess. Um, yeah, here from Be live from Beirut. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks for doing this again. Um, so uh, first, first thing, like with most, I'm go I'm gonna tackle one part with you, Firas, first because I think that unless I'm mistaken, most artists here don't have a management, and uh, I want you to tell like your experience of. Uh, when so you when when you started as Mashro Layla, you had a management. Oh no! At first you didn't have a management. Then you had a management, and now you're without a management. It's been about three or four years or something. Yeah, um, now it's a weird hybrid uh, thing. Yeah, I think but so. basically, I guess I mean for the first um, six years or five years when we started, um, there was no management. We. We didn't really know, you know, we were 20 and uh, we were not sure of what a manager would do for us or how, what, what the roles, what the codified roles of the music industry was. And we were all design students who had, uh, you know, architecture and design students and we had very rigid ideas about the things we wanted. So uh, for better or for worse. So we were very keen on doing everything ourselves, which went from 
you know, figuring out how to market yourself or get making flyers or zines. This is pre, this is, I mean, at the beginning of YouTube and the beginning of social media. So we were very heavily reliant on word of mouth and kind of on the ground uh, marketing and communication uh, for about five years until we uh, landed a spot on uh, uh, Biblos and then Biblos Festival and then Balbak International Festival. And then uh, we, uh, we had a manager for about five years as well. Um, and I think, I mean, in terms, I don't know, this is, a, this is something that it, it really depends on every person because, you know, a lot of people like to say that they want to focus completely on the music and have somebody you know, take care of everything else and so that they have the space and the time and the, I don't know, I guess the freedom to create and things. For us, it's always been very different. We've, I've, I've been very hands-on. I like being involved with um, looking at how marketing is going, looking at how um, you know, a vision or a kind of a, a strategy can be laid out, um, things like that. And there, there's always this mistake that a manager will fix everything, will make everything work. But I mean, one thing that I've learned, whether it's management or anybody else for that matter, whether it's your agents, whether it's your, uh, um, I don't know, your publishers, whether whoever it is, nobody's going to be more passionate about it than you. Like, it's just not going to happen. So, so once you, once you internalize the idea that nobody's going to be working harder than you. So if you're not doing the hardest work, then you can't expect the manager to come in and say, you know, come on, I've been working, you know, you, you give people the, it's you, you know, it's the, the artist is at the center of it. And everybody else is rotating and figuring out how to find their position within this sphere, but without a solid and, and a, a very effective center, it kind of falls apart. And this is something that, you know, it's very frustrating as well, because sometimes you feel like you don't have the knowledge or you don't have the skills or you don't have the ability to, um, pick up a phone for three, four hours a day. But um, at some point, I believe this is kind of my own personal way that I do things is that you have to be aware of how it's done. You don't have to do it, but you have to at least, at the very least, be aware of how it's done and what needs to be done. And when somebody gives you a proposal, whether it's a contract or whether it's an artistic proposal, you have to be as good with both of those things. Uh, you have to know the, the basics of what what you want and how you want to get it done, whether it's creative or whether it's technical. I don't know. This is just kind of my my view on things, and it, it, a lot of people are are very unhappy with this view of the world. My view of the world. I mean, I remember we, I had a, a a chat, a similar chat, maybe a year ago with Anthony. Actually, who was there with another artist, and it was the opposite point of view, which is like. I want to be able to practice eight hours a day and not pick up the phone and have nobody talk to me. And I think that's a, that's a fair and, and just vision and it's the ideal. This is like the ideal, but for somebody who's working their way to that, there are steps along the way that you have to do. You can't miss a step. You go, it's people, you know, the race is very quick and the race is, is very vicious. So, it's about being able to find calm and, and spaces to create and be, being comfortable in creating, but also knowing how to be in a room pitching your project or be in a, in a meeting and, and arguing for, I don't know, a better percentage or a better clause or a better rights or better, you know, this is, this is kind of my belief. And I don't know, I don't know what your, your, you, you guys have had experience in or where you think this works or doesn't work or something. Yeah, I wanted to, so just before, before I, want, I want to hear all your opinions about when it comes to management. Uh, before that, um, I, I also, from a per personal point of view, uh, and I think Sandra would be able to, to jump in here. Uh, I think that with Mashro Leila, and correct me if I'm wrong, Piras, I think one of the things that really helped you guys at the beginning was that you guys coincided with when Facebook and all the, all the social media platforms became what they, like at the beginning when organic reach and all that stuff was still a thing. And yeah. that happened, if you look even today at some of the, 
the biggest names in the music industry, other than the ones that are signed with, with labels. But I mean, when you think of things, bands like Arcade Fire or, or Arctic Monkeys or Falls or whatever, oh, there, there seems to be a, a wave that came between 2006 and 2009, which was right when Facebook launched and became a worldwide phenomenon. And I think that that played a big role because as you said, you guys had to learn about the marketing. At first you were doing it yourselves. Then it became, I think, because I remember even, I even remember being on your first Facebook group and at first it was just a few friends. And then it became, there was the event at Demco Steel. And then it became like, you know, another group for that. And then pages became a thing. And I remember how that, that, that evolution happened. So I want to know from everyone else, like in your experience, cor correct me if I'm wrong, Firas, by the way. If, mm. No, 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 it's completely correct. Um, um, definitely the, the push of social media, whether it was Facebook in the beginning or uh, YouTube very soon after, uh, it played a very big part in accessing audience, like being having access to audience in a way that I hadn't had with the artist that I admire or that the artist that I listen to, you know, it was always, it was always the idea of mystery around artists and mystique around big personalities and big bands for that, for me before that, maybe because uh, I was living in Lebanon and everything. Um, but it was always a question of, I want to know more how, what is this about watching VHS videos or, recording that one concert that was streamed on MTV or so. And then suddenly in, in, in the matter of a few years that access completely changed. And this was something that we were kind of, uh, you know, part of, and we were very active and communicating and we always had a focus. My life, I think also it's a big part of uh, our education in AUB as architects and designers where there's a lot of emphasis on um, narrative and storytelling and building building something whether it's a building or a concept or a city building something around uh, you know pra shared practices and narratives and uh, stories really and so we were always in our communication we were always very firm about making sure that every post had a story had a reason or a little anecdote or a little character, you know, in the beginning we used to sign all our, our, our messages or posts with love Layla or, uh, uh, you know, Min Layla or something like that to create a bit of fictional, to create the, a little bit of this fictional world about, you know, the band and, and about it being something bigger than a bunch of people, you know. So definitely there was a big push and then very soon after that, getting a video out onto YouTube was really a very big deal. And it was a very, it was a very homemade video that we made with a few friends, Yellow Studio here, um, and put it online for fun, like, just, just, just for fun. And, uh, and things started picking up from there because YouTube was all, also gaining popularity. And, you know, there's a huge, there's a huge amount of people that are, are just uh, watching now on phones. Like, like, people don't consume media apart from phones anymore. So it's completely cannibalized a lot of other things. And video is such an important part of the way that I work, whether it's live performance or even working, scoring, uh, composing, like a, a visual thing is, is very important. And I think it's, it's you know, reflected very much in the, in the social practices that we've developed over the past 10 years, yeah. you know? I think we should, we'll, we'll focus on that in a bit. I just want to know if anyone has had experiences with a manager or, or what's your perception of a manager or why you think having a manager is important. I want to hear your point of view because I used to manage many bands and I've stopped managing bands and artists and I, for many reasons, but, uh, which I can get into. But I want to hear first from, from you guys if anyone has had any experience with a manager or what's your perception of a manager go on un unmute yourselves just feel free to to give your your two cents i have a question um I, i've never had a manager my question is when you don't have a manager are you also producing the events yourselves or are you working with a producer and how much do those roles overlap between a manager and a producer 
mm. of an event or the producer of of your music event when it comes to an event it, de it depends it really depends i mean because there's some uh, i mean when i used to manage postcards at the time i used to produce the events as well uh, when I stopped managing them, they obviously continue doing events, which is normal, and, and they've gone on from strength to, to strength. But I, I think that when it comes to having a manager, a manager isn't necessarily someone who knows how to organize events. He, he or she is someone who knows how to put in line like a structure for you to be able to, I don't know, a plan or, you know, whether it's a strategy of marketing or whatever, or to get you some gigs, or to get on your social media or to whatever whatever it means because an, a manager today can be considered as an assistant can be considered as someone who is there to help you and answer your emails and is someone who gets you gigs and is someone it, it's a it can be anything it depends on the character and the person but when it comes to an event the manager has absolutely nece not necessarily anything to do with it like in the case of postcards, it just so happened that I'm someone who organizes events. So in parallel, I was doing this. But it, it's not one is not dependent on the other at all. To, to put it yeah, in. actually, most in in most of the in most of the world where markets like live music markets are established and venues are established, they're quite pretty distinct. I think it's only in places like uh, maybe Lebanon, maybe Egypt, or uh, Tunisia a little bit, Jordan, where they mix because it's still a, you know, live music is still gaining a little bit of its footing and managers end up being promoters and end up having to, to put on shows and things because that's the only way to do it. A lot of times it's the only way to do it. But the way that it works, like the chain is, you know, it's about a lot of middlemen actually from, from the band to the stage is a lot of middlemen. And it's a lot of, uh, you know, a promoter, an agent, manager, a band, a collection agency, whatever. Like, there's a, a lot of people that are involved within the, the circle. And it depends on what stage of your, uh, like, uh, what stage of growth you are in, the, the, the pe people are there or not. It's all the same thing for having a manager. Like, it's, especially as a young, as an artist that is still uh, developing and growing and, and acquiring a fan base, a manager can have a very key role if this person is creative, if this person is able to think, think in a in a creative way, and it could also be somebody like Anthony Singh who's really just doing logistics, and um, you know making sure that the things get where they need to be and the people. And I mean, in the band dynamic for us, you know, we were at some point we were seven members on the road and six members on the road. And the manager has a lot to do with managing relationships. And, uh, you know, That's musicians, comp composers are big personalities. Sorry, Anthony. That was one of the reasons why I stopped, to be honest. Because it ended up being, uh, when you're managing relationships between different people, not, not necessarily to, to any bands, uh, but I mean, as a general, as a whole thing, even my relationships with them, I could feel that it was, you know, I was seeing an effect on my side which was not necessarily positive towards them because uh you take as you, as firas was saying nobody's gonna work harder than you on your own project so um at the end of the day I, I personally believe that dependent on how big you are i think when you start or if you're at a certain level and by level the only way you can know is on to be right out there full on is depending on how this is this might sound really bad but i probably did but depending on how much money you're making from your music, that's when you know whether or not you need a manager. Because if you're earning per month $2,000 or $1,000 or $500, then having a manager who's taking 10% of that for him or her to be doing the amount of work they're doing, it's not worth it for them and it's not worth it for you. So I think that at the end of the day, have, and that's where the growth comes in because with manage, having a management, is I think it's a luxury and it's a luxury that you can afford when you start earning the money to pay for that luxury. Uh, at the beginning, when you're earning small fees, I mean, I don't think it's a necessity at first. You need to, you, I think it's important, like Pira said, to be hands-on and to know what's happening and to go and put your hand and to see and to go through the work because 
it's work at the end of the day. It's, it's, a, it's a job in itself, you know, to be a musician. But my, well, we'll get into that later, as I mentioned to those who were here last week. Uh, for me, a musician is no longer, I mean, an artist is no longer just a musician. An artist is a 360 degree thing today. It's no longer, I'm just a musician and that's it. Today, it's I'm a musician, I'm a content creator, I'm a, I'm a, I could be a teacher, I can be a whatever, um, anything. I, I'll, we'll go through that later. But um, I think that that's, that's the main thing, that you have to go through these steps. The, the industry has changed so much that with the amount of music there is out there, as I mentioned earlier, the amount of artists there are out there, you need to be really like extraordinary to be able to say to yourself, okay, now I can be afford, I can afford to pay for a manager X amount per month. Um, that's my opinion, but I still don't think at the moment for anyone who's emerging, who's not in that five percent of earning ten thousand dollars or more, I don't think it's. It's. I think it's a question of what you expect management to do. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it's a question. I don't know. I know. Uh, now, when 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 Karim, our our uh, our manager at the time, when Karim approached us, his his vision was very aligned with what we wanted and so it was very clearly it was clear that okay this person is saying the things that we are saying alone when we're in the studio and so therefore it makes sense you know we were saying okay we've been playing uh, in the arab world we've been playing in egypt we've been playing Heda. how are we going to get our music to uh, uh, beyond the arab world all the, all the arab speaking people are out you know out there and w what he said in the first meeting was like listen I think you're doing a great job here, but I want to take you to Paris. I don't want to take you to London. And, I, and so it was exactly, it was, the synergy was very clearly there, you know? And then there's the question, which, which is the eternal question as well, which is the idea of getting signed or not getting signed or being on a label or not being on a label. And how do you navigate that? And that was a big part of, of um, having a manager for us because after Ibn al in, in 2015, beginning of 2016, we, we had done uh, five records on our own, basically. We had uh, self-funded, crowd-funded, uh, you know, grant-funded, any kind of funding you can think of, we had done along those five records. And so at that point we were like, okay, I think it's time for uh, getting the right label on board and thinking about how to work through this, which is a lot harder than expected. And until today we are uh, as yet unsigned, you know. A lot of people have shown interest. Obviously with Mashru Alayla, it's also a lot of uh, back and forth because of, uh, in the Arab world, there's a big fear of the image. There's a big fear of the boundaries that are being pushed. Everybody wants to play it safe. Outside the Arab world, it's the Arabic language that becomes a, a problem very quickly. I mean, people are afraid of what they have never done and nobody's really released Arabic music on a, on a kind of a small indie label or on a pop label that, that deals with smaller artists. So it's, it's still until today a challenge and, um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear from you guys what you think, what you think, I mean, where you feel a management uh, would, would step in and maybe then we can start detailing because a lot of things have also to do with agencies and, and you know, having an agent sometimes is more important than having a manager, I think, you know. Um, especially if you're looking to play live, which everybody knows is the main source of revenue, which is why everybody's, uh, all the artists are having a, a tough time. You know, it's, this is very clear for us um, by now, you know, it's, it's June. We were supposed to have over 20 shows and we've had one. So that changes completely the entire thing. Everything changes. Once, once you remove live music from the equation, everything changes. And the key thing for live music is, is to me, is having a good agent that believes in the music and has the right ability to put you on festival circuits, to put you on, uh, I don't know, kind of events, to put you there. I think agents can also... So I'd just like to know, Hiki, like especially from people who have not yet had an experience with management, but also from the people who have, like what the, what the expectations were and where they fell short, I guess. Yeah. Can I step in? Um, personally, I've worked with a lot of uh, uh, and a lot of roles in this industry, from stage management to 
and I've worked with a lot of managers or people or key people in this uh, in this whole ecosystem. And I think uh, my main point is uh, at what uh, what phase does this manager comes in? If it was the earliest phases of the band, or if it's uh, after a couple of years, because like any, for example, like any company, if you get a CEO uh, to to have to start up a, a company, and then you get after 15 years, you get another CEO. The mindset and the culture and the relationships and the growth of this company or this band or this uh, structure. Uh, it needs uh, an innovative mindset. It needs people to think in a sustainable way. How to um, like to think uh, how that the industry is changing as well. So that's my main point around um, what uh, what our managers uh, importance in a, in, a, in this form. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I lost the sound for a little bit for a moment because like I sent the Dubai warning about lockdown, but so I missed a few of your points at the end. Um, okay. But yeah, I think a manager would be, um, I, I would look into, I mean, I would want, first of all, the manager to want to manage me and not me run after a manager to begin with because they want to have to, you know, they, I want them to want to do the work um, to get me to the next level and stuff. Um, and in the meantime, I'll put in my, my bits creatively and, you know, all that. Uh, but I think their connections is super important. They need to be people, like, they need to know people. Uh, any manager would need to know people. And maybe know, have a bit of a um, law experience or some knowledge in, in you know, contracts or certain negotiations. Um, plus, one thing that it would be good is that they could not like I wouldn't be the bad guy in the talks in a way like if there's a deadline or anything I always the audio dropped can't hear you it's the Dubai warning <laughs> but now we have two do you guys see two of her at the bottom of the screen yeah 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 we do so we have to get rid of that now we have three of her. <laughs> One's working. Sorry, one's like. uh, Dubai. <laughs> Freaking you. We have three of you at the bottom of the screen. So I don't know if you want to. Yeah, just one of them moved. Wait, let's see the other. One second. I don't know. Anthony, I think you can kick them out. I'm trying to do that. It's not working. But uh, <laughs> yeah, keep going. Anyway, keep going, keep going, continue, doesn't matter. No, so I was just saying, you know, it, it'd be good to not be the person that's always following up on, um, like I actually had to use a, a, a fake manager email to get uh, a music video that took over a year, even though I did everything and there was a, an agreement between us, I only paid half the payment, but I was just, I was not taken seriously as an independent artist and he had bigger clients and stuff. So as soon as I used the manager, to like, you know, send an email about the edits that need to be done and stuff. Um, I was respected more. I don't know about that. <laughs> you, you, you guys tell me what you think, but I think that the people who perceive things like that aren't really people, I mean, personally, I, those are people I wouldn't want to work with, personally. Yeah, I mean, I never worked with them again, but you don't know that before. Right. <laughs> so a manager would have been nice. Right. Um, a, real, a real manager would have been nice to kind of, you know, take that position because it was, it added so much stress to me. Every time I tried to, you know, plan that release and then I, you know, I came up with like a lawyer name manager, yeah. like a Sam Hansen thing. <laughs> and he freaked, he, he, he'd call me up and tell me that your manager's crazy, man. I'm like, mm. yeah, he's nuts. You should really, and then he did. So, you know, a real one would have <laughs> would yeah. be nice. Cool, cool, cool. Um, if does anyone want to jump in on the manager thing? Like, does anyone wants like any feedback or anything? I just wanted to share my experience real quick and what I've drawn from it. Um, basically, I saw it actually. I I started feeling the need for someone when I was um, I wanted to do a music video and I didn't know the first thing about like video production or anything like that, and um, I felt like um, I needed. To consult someone who was 
in the, the field and who would have my back in, and, and tell me if there was anything that was um, overpriced or anything that could be done more easily or any, any way that we could make the process simpler and things like that. And so um, I, know, I knew this girl who had worked on The Voice and so I, um, The Voice here in Lebanon and I thought, and I knew that she had studied film. So I thought uh, it'd be cool to, to, to seek her help um, and see if she could, because she was interested in music and video and she knew very well all about it. And it was very, very helpful at first and but then she realized that she wasn't so much interested in the um, everything um, like technical about streaming and things like that and she was more about the um, like she was happy to help me on on um, like punctual things such as this issue for example rather than uh, follow up on the whole um, productivity and and generating uh, money and things like that and so it made me think that maybe it would be good to have someone trustworthy in the different areas of a career that we could go to rather than one person in charge of everything because you lose a lot um, in the process. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, think I have to, I mean, even, even from a personal level, when I started out managing bands, I had no idea about, I, I had no idea about anything. Like, I, I, I winged it half the way, you know, but the thing is, I was, I was very insistent on learning and not learning through YouTube videos or whatever, because nobody knows, as I said, nobody knows your, con your context, your context is different. All our contexts are different, especially in Lebanon, where we think, you know, we, we have to deal with so many different factors, especially today, you know. Um, I think, un unfortunately, I, I see what you mean. Maybe someone can handle the negotiation part. Someone can handle the, you know, the, the social media. Someone can, but like at, at the beginning, you're going to have to, unfortunately or fortunate, I think it's a fortunate thing to do, to go through that process and learn along the way. Because afterwards, when you're going to end up, I don't know, five years or 10 years from now, you're going to look and be like, you know, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have learned how to approach things. Even today, when I negotiate to bring an artist over to Lebanon or, to work with me in any capacity, that my negotiation and my approach to it is really simple. It's never going to be do or die, you know. Whereas at the beginning, we all we all tend to think it's do or die, and it's just at the end of the day. If you don't want to, let's say this is my budget. Do you want to come? Do you want to do this? Do you want to perform? Yes, great. No, next. You know, there's a million people out there. Like you can't. I, I know there's a weight on your shoulder when you think of it. And you're like, yeah, but I want this specific video and this. And this will go back to something that I mentioned uh, last week. Um, and I mention it often whenever I speak is that when you think of a video clip, let's say, uh, especially a video clip, because a lot of artists put a lot of weight on video clips. Uh, when you consider that people wipe it down in less than a second, uh, and it takes you, I don't know how much time to put it together. And that the average human being sees between a thousand and 10,000 pieces of content a day. Then it makes you realize that that budget you put on that video today is no longer worth what it was five years ago or 10 years ago. So the, I, my, I, I will say this forever to anyone who's willing to listen. Sandra and I have spoken about this a million times and I will speak about it to everyone. I'll say, if you have a budget for a video clip, put it on promoting the video clip and film anything. Like you can, uh, and I always use the example of, I say, I would rather watch a cockroach in slow motion for four minutes and that's your video clip. It will catch everyone's attention, but it's the music that's going to that's gonna work. Because if you promote it with whatever money you were going to put on the video clip, it's going to reach more people than the other way around. Because at the end of the day, that's, it's the visibility thing. It's unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know. It's a subjective opinion, but it's... Unless, a, it's, unless it's a big part of your image. Oh, yeah. But if it's a big part of your image, which a lot, like Mashro Leila, in their case, there's a lot of... A lot of it is about image and identity and approach and whatever. And um, I just think that when it comes to today's world, when you're an emerging artist, uh, the video clip has to be secondary to just getting out there and being present as mm. possible. 
I know I have a few things. I just I'd like to add some of the some of the comments that came in are very interesting. Gerard's comment of the stage of a manager and the idea of a CEO. It's a I mean, I think I think for me the CEO of the company is the artist. It it for me, I don't know. This is the way I see it. If the creative vision is driven, at least if you're if you're a writer or you're a producer or you're a composer, that's the way it has to go. I mean, if you're a band that is, um, I don't know, if you're a band like One Direction or I don't know who that is, you know, getting content onboarded to them or getting uh, uh, songs written and sent to them, then it's a different case. But if there's an artistic vision that's coming from within, I feel that this, that's, that's the CEO kind of. And then, then you have, a, a, you know, a manager and the manager is, the manager can come and for me, the, the stage that a manager should enter in is when there is um, a revenue stream that is beginning to emerge so that there, there is something that can be managed and you don't end up. The worst thing for me was having that process. And it, this was before a manager, but thinking of how am I going to make money? Because everybody can, can think of ways to make money and 99% of them don't work. And the manager will do just the same. He'll tell you, listen, why don't you sit on a rooftop and feel like people will come up with all kinds of things to, to think of how to promote your work. But that's not the point. The manager has to come in a, at a stage when the revenue stream is getting in and it needs improvement. When the identity and the image and the, and the fan base is starting to grow and needs improvement. When, uh, you know, the, the team is coming together, whether it's agents, whether it's you know, registration, registering your stuff and needs improvement. Like that's where I feel a manager can be the most effective is when there's enough work for him to not have, or her to not have the time to say, okay, what music are you going to send me this week? Like if the, if your manager is waiting for you to send music, the manager is, is taking money for free. Like that's the way I see it. No offense to any managers, but like if, 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 if you're not supplying people in the team enough content or enough music or enough ideas, even if it's not music, even if it's ideas and saying, listen, I have a vision for this thing that I want to achieve within six months. This is what I want to do. Maybe it's building up to one live performance. Maybe it's building up to one release. Maybe it's building up to one thing. I don't know. But that is where I feel a manager is most effective. And then it becomes a, a lot of number crunching. I mean, I think there's a lot of number crunching to be done, looking at all the stats, looking at what trends are working when things are not working. This is something that I also think artists should be a little bit aware of going into their YouTube creator page or YouTube studio, going into the back end of Spotify, going into the back end of Anrami or Deezer or whatever it is, and making a little bit of sense or CD Baby or DistroKid or whatever way you're distributing your music and having a little bit of insight into what's working and what's not. Because I'm personally, I'm not a very strong believer in the sense that this is my art and if people like it, great. If they don't, so be it. I don't adhere very strictly to that. I think that as a composer, it's a relationship. And sometimes looking at, at uh, things that work the way that things are being shaped because of distribution chains or because of consumption chains can actually improve the music and not the other way around. A lot of people come to me and say, but well, wouldn't you be selling out? Wouldn't you be ruining the music? Wouldn't you be uh, less of an artist and more of a uh, product? And I don't think so. I think if you're able to take those factors and still create something powerful with it, it's better for me. So it's I, that's the that's the idea of where, what stage a manager can come in. I definitely agree that it's much better for the artist not to be the asshole in the relationship. This is this is something definitely true, and that we've I've faced a lot of times without a manager, um, especially within the Arab world where it's very tough to work. Sometimes the conditions of work are very very tough and very grueling, and uh, you can very possibly arrive to a stage an hour before performance and nothing is ready. It happens, like it's a reality. So in that case, but again, I don't know if a manager is that right person. Maybe it's an assistant or maybe it's a, a something in that sort because again, the manager I think should always be a little bit uh, trying to put the pieces in place and trying to look at top level decisions that are, that are about 
setting a goal, which an artist has to do and say like, let's say I want to be able, by this time next year, I want to have scored four films, okay? And this is how I'm thinking of doing it. What are your ideas and how can we work together? Together is the key word here, together on this into achieving this thing. If you send anybody, whether it's a manager or whether it's a band member or whether it's a collaborator alone in a room to do something, it's just something's gonna roll, go wrong at some point, you know, this is the way I see it. I don't know if, if uh, what, are you, what you guys are thinking or, or something like that. Um, so I don't know if I can say something, um, like a little bit of uh, what's been going on with me. Uh, I'm someone who, like I'm a singer songwriter, I do the arrangements of all my songs. So when a musician comes, I give them the, you know, the sheet music. I'm like, okay, you play this. Um, so I'm kind of like one man show. I do the posters, I do the flyers, I do everything, social media, YouTube, video. I'm a video editor, so I edit my videos and everything. But one of the things that I struggled with when I started uh, was um, lack of guidance because I had no clue about anything. Like, I didn't even know what a producer does. I just know, I hear the word producer, I don't even know what he does. And it was very, very hard. And I just like, was somebody, can somebody just guide me? Where do I go? What, what do I do? Um, had it not been for Michelle Polikiewicz, whom I have, like, I know her from maybe 2001, and that I know that she's into the music and for la music, maybe I would have haven't been anywhere because she's the one who was like, okay, do this, do that. And she helped me as much as she could. And at some point, so I understood that, okay, great. I'll just do live music, live music. And I started seeing great response in my concerts. So, you know, like when, when you give music and people are overwhelmed and they, they enjoy it, you feel like, wow, okay, I want to do more of that. Um, at some point, at two moments, uh, someone approached me and he was like maybe 75. He has a company and he was like, yeah, I want to, let's, let's meet. I want to work with you. I want to promote you. I want to book you for festivals. And I haven't released anything. Like I, nobody told me that I should release. I, I always thought I should go for an album. And I didn't, it didn't even occur to me that I can just release a single and do a video for that. Nobody told me. So I suffered a lot because of this, and I'm, I'm still suffering because of that. And uh, this guy, he also like, for a woman, it's hard because there was a sexual harassment issue with that guy. So, um, and then, you know, I dropped him and then another guy came along and he was like not professional at all. So I also just kind of stopped talking to him. So it was very hard and the turning point of my music happened when I met my boyfriend two and a half years ago because he's been someone who's been like <laughs> ever since he met me he was like I'm the president of your fan club okay <laughs> there he is <laughs> he, he said like I'm the president of your fan club I adore your music I want to promote you I want to help you <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, he's been like protecting me from, you know, all these, I don't know, it's been very, very hard. And even I've, I've struggled because um, like I, I organized my own concerts and uh, I had many incidents where they uh, ripped me off at the door financially. So I was like, it was constantly negative uh, experiences after the other. And at the same time, like I'm composing and writing songs and writing songs. So it's been really, really difficult. And you know, like, because I'm an emerging artist and I'm unregistered, as uh, you said, Anthony, um, you know, it's very hard when you don't have someone guiding you. It doesn't need to be a manager. Like maybe Michelle told me in Europe, they have a resource center, like someone who's starting up they will just go to this resource center and they'll, you know, research and, you know, all this information is available. Here, it's too, too hard. Really, it's too hard. Yeah, yeah. Well, well um, first of all, th thanks for sharing that. I mean, uh, I'm sure it's not, it's not easy to, to share that sort of information. And um, uh, so thank you. And I'm sure we're all here to, to help you out with anything. Um, but allow me to say, so first of all, when it comes to, uh, the, the, the best part, at least for me with today, 
is uh, that you have more control than ever before, meaning uh, the manager and uh, you know all those things that have that have been like the weight on the shoulder of an artist and whether it's you know it can be a be it a label manager be it a manager itself be it whoever it is i think today because of the the tool which most people despise well they don't despise it because we all use it which is social media because mm -hmm. of social media I, seriously like every i don't know one person who doesn't bash social media but they're all on it so like 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 you know it's like whatever um, the point is today everyone is in control of that and I think with that as I mentioned before uh, I mentioned to those who were here last week um, you have an opportunity which is massive in terms of what you can use to to reach more people um, I think this is where we like divert into that to shift away from from the management uh, management topic um, uh, I, I know Sa Sandra is releasing a single, Firas, uh, sorry, an album. Firas is releasing a, an album as well. Um, I, all of you are releasing different things. I, I know Bea is releasing as well, uh, I think a single as well. Um, so I, I, like, the, I know everyone is releasing something. And when we think of it, we think of it with a lot of weight, which is, I, I think, a mistake to, to begin with. When we think of the weight, what what I think also is like what I'm seeing with Sandra, for instance, which I think you're doing super well is, you know, because I, I wanted to write yesterday, Sandra put a post and said something like, uh, sorry, guys, I'm going to be, you know, like putting it in your faces about this album. And in my head, I was like, absolutely, there should be no sorry. Like I was like, this is the job of promoting on social media. You, we can, uh, well, that was on my personal page. Yeah, but still, still. Not on Sam's page. Doesn't matter. I wouldn't. Well, on the personal page, people would be like, "Oh, she's all, always promoting herself," and which, you know, on Sam's page, I wouldn't feel that way, of course, because it's yeah, all about the music, right? If someone, if this is the same with me and with the same of everyone else, it's an unfortunate truth of the way we are as human beings. When someone introduces you to someone else or speaks about you, they say it's Sandra, the singer of Sand Moon. It's Anthony, the guy of Beirut Jam Sessions. It's Firas from Mashro Leila. It's, 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 there's always a tag that goes along with that. It doesn't mean it's a good thing. I don't know. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it, it is the reality. So uh, for me, when it comes to promoting yourself, I go back to the same thing, which is that knowing that we're all, you know, on our phones all the time. Oh, our phones do this. On here. Um, it, goes, it goes on our, we're, we're checking, like we're seeing a thousand to 10,000, you know, pieces of content a day. From the minute we wake up to the minute we sleep, there is a truth, which is you have to be present on all of them and you have to be consistently present on all of them. It's not a, it's, Put it this way, how many times have you seen on Instagram when you're scrolling down a post that's written 18 hours ago or two days ago or one day ago or whatever? The algorithm works very st stupidly. So unfortunately, unfortunately or fortunately, it's become a, a, I keep saying that because it depends on your perspective. I think it's a fortunate situation where um, it's become a quantity, a quantity game. And the more you post, the more you're the more you, and it's because I will see one post of yours. If you post 10 times a day, I'm going to see one of them. And I'm someone who follows you. And you can post the same thing 10 times. And I'm only going to see it once. So the thing is, it's just the, the repetitiveness of things. It doesn't matter how you do it. It's just the, it's being there and being present all the time. When you look at overall social media, so the, the key ones that I, I think of in general, so yeah, you have Facebook, you have Instagram, you have YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, and TikTok. Those are six, okay? Those six, and even when people say TikTok, and most people laugh and they're like, ah, it's a, you know, kids thing, whatever. I always remind people, Instagram started as a photography app. Facebook started as a university app. All these apps started as something and evolved into something else. They all have to evolve with the times. The thing you have to remember is that all of these 
other than TikTok, which is the youngest one, the five others, they offer the same thing. So they offer uh, images, they offer videos, they offer comments, they offer followers. So that's on each one, you have the same offering. So why on earth would you not be present on all of them when you have different people using different ones? Just because worse in our heads, we think that everyone is on Facebook and Instagram and that's it. Whereas the others are also working and they're all working pretty, pretty well. Um, on top of this, that's why I always mention to people um, to never cross promote between social media. So when you have a new video clip and you want to, you, you upload it on YouTube and you share it on Facebook, Facebook reads it as a red, a red sign that you shouldn't go there. Like it does everything not to drive you off its channel. So because Facebook offers a video offering too. So they want you to upload the video on their platform. Instagram wants you to up upload the video on their platform. Uh, LinkedIn wants you to, all of them want you to upload native content onto their platforms. So when you have a new piece of content, I advise you to be on all of them because different people use different things all the time. So um, that's why, that's how I see it. I mean, Firas, I don't know what your opinion is from that, that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know me, you know me. I'm very bad at, at uh, uh, social media. I'm terrible at it. I only have Instagram and I only opened Instagram like two years ago uh, because I needed, because I wanted to put some work on there basically. Yeah. But yeah. no, no, I agree. I mean, when you say it, I feel like obviously, you know, I feel well, obviously I should do it. <laughs> the thing is, there's a, there's a mistake that, 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 artists have in their heads and i'm sure you will all maybe disagree with this but the, the perception of content is mistaken for songs so when we tell people release content they think we're telling them to release songs and there's a big difference between that because you can release one song and off the back of one song have 50 pieces of content which can be a 10 second clip of your video clip. It can be you playing the 10 seconds of your note, the first notes of, of the song. It can be you talking about why you wrote the song. It can be you filming people listening to the song. It can be whatever. It doesn't really matter. You mean, you mean as posts or stories? Sorry. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just to, to be active, to be all the time active on social media. I, some people don't like it, but today we have, we're in a situation which has just proven completely why if you're not active on it then when the time comes and things are going to go back to normal you're going to lose the race you know like it's 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 un, it's, it's, it's the reality it's not something that i'm inventing the artists we all love and follow are hyperactive whether we like it or not and again it doesn't matter if you're i'm not telling you to film what you cook and to film every five seconds of your life not at all that's not at all where I'm going. I'm just telling you that you guys as artists are far more interesting than you give yourselves credit for. And at the same time, when you, when you think of putting content out there, you overthink it so much. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, I don't know any artist I've met who has not told me, no, but, you know, if I post this, you know, you know, you know it's not the right, I don't feel it, it's not right. And maybe people don't like it. Maybe, and I always say, who, who cares what people think? The idea is that people are going to see what you're putting out there. So it's relevant to you. You're a singer, great. You're a musician, you play an instrument, great. You listen to music, great. People can, you know, I, I follow a lot of artists and I see how they do it. And they're at it, you know, they're like going proper. So um, at the end of the day, the result is there. I'm not inventing anything. So uh, I, I've said it before, you know, qu quantity is, is, not, is not subjective, but quality is. So maybe for some people, they're like, no, but you know, this is a bad song. For you, it might be, but for someone else, it might be great. So it's, uh, quality is really a subjective matter. Huh? It's, again, it doesn't need to be thought of that much. Mm -hmm. If you just, I don't know, anything, doesn't anything. There. Especially when you think of how much you guys as musicians, irrespective of, of your experience or of your age or of your anything there's no more all, all those boundaries have been broken we're all playing the same game the social media game whether we like it or not our favorite artists all of them are on it all of them and those who decide to disappear off it end up losing in the long run so it's 
the same way 10, 20 years ago you had MTV and everyone wanted to get on MTV and do their stuff. Today that the medium has changed, but the, the formula is the same. It's just there's more access. So, Yeah, I mean, one thing that, that I think is, is important for everybody to hear is that all of these, all of these uh, distributors, I guess, or platforms are very helpful and very supportive to artists. I mean, every time I've talked to anybody from whether it's Deezer or Spotify or Andami or Apple, they're always very supportive to help uh, artists get their things on there, giving advice, uh, trying to feature it, trying to make whatever banners or posts or whatever. So it's not like they're they're only looking for the super ultra mega celebrity stars, uh, which sometimes it might seem it might look like it, but they're really not. And all of them, all of every single like uh, artist artist relations or artist management that at these companies has been really somebody who knows the music that's coming out of the territories first of all and is not somebody who's uh, ignorant or or tone deaf not ignorant tone deaf and uh, and there's somebody who appreciates the effort and the you know the strife the struggle to put something out there i mean i, I was yeah go on Leo. I have a question. I have a question, especially on the quantity over quality thing. And we spoke a little bit about building your image as an artist. And I know I'm guilty of, of putting too much consideration of what I want to post and then I just end up not posting. Um, but so what do you think about that? Do you have, do you suggest it's important when you're posting the quantity, when you're posting a lot, do you think it's important to be considerate about what image it builds of you and how much I'm getting, I'm, I'm, letting my audience know who I am or who I want them to think I am or, or whatever it is. No, because who, who the audience think you are is subjective. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's not something that you can control. You have no control over that. So meaning what, if you, if you today put an amazing song out there that you've worked on for six months and you think it's the best piece of content, content or music or whatever you want to call it, whatever you put out there, maybe there's a bunch of people who are going to hate it and, that's that's why it's super subjective that's why when it comes to posting the only way to win over the formula the algorithm on social media is to post a lot i'm not saying to post 10 times a day but i'm saying to post consistently i was recently contacted by by a band that that i'm friends with that aren't in lebanon and they're like we're releasing an ep a three three song ep uh how can you help us like, what can you do for us and whatever? And I gave them a very simple plan. I said, it's really simple. You have three songs. I'm like, in the, in the span of the way things work today, with fast content, with so many platforms, so, many, so much stuff that we're seeing, I told them three songs means three weeks of work. It's a simple. Week one, first song. Monday, you release the single. Tuesday, you go live on Instagram. Wednesday, you do, a, you, you do an interview with someone on, I don't know what. Thursday, you do the acoustic version. When Friday, you do whatever. Saturday, you, you show the behind the scenes. Boom, next Monday, new single. Next. <laughs> tabit, already tabit. <laughs> it works. Because, because we think of, when we think of the single, we think of the video and we think of the process and we think of all that stuff. I'm telling you, if you put no weight on the single part the part that is i have to pay a, pro a guy who's going to produce and this and that and so on and more on the how do i promote this to reach the most amount of people then you're going to see a difference you're going to see a difference because all of a sudden for six days of a whole week that's the song shit monday new song wow amazing same thing then the following week that's three songs by the fourth week, you tell them, I'm bye, see you guys in six months. And you're back with a new EP. And you do the same thing. That's, that's why the, the, like there's some bands like Arcade Fire, their last album, what they did was every song was released with a, with a one week plan of releasing a music clip that kind of followed up. It was kind of like a movie, like, a, you know? So the first part was, you know, this, they did the whole thing. And for the whole week, you were, you were seeing that and you were waiting for it. It's like watching Netflix. On Netflix, they release series, they do, they put up a series that every Monday, like, you know, I'll give you the example of the, I don't know if you guys saw that Michael Jordan 
series thing that came out. Every Monday they were putting it out there and everyone was waiting for Monday. They were just like, Monday is coming, so it's going to be there. Then you, during the week you saw articles, you saw interviews, you saw this. It was kind of building up. Then Monday came again. Same thing happened. Then Monday, and then they were like, okay, done. It's over. After six weeks, it was done. And you're just like, that was amazing. It did what it had to do. Knowing the way things work today, that's how it is. Even now with Beirut Jam Sessions, I'm thinking like that. I'm thinking like the next piece of whatever I create is going to be a month-long thing where I have four pieces of content or four pieces of whatever I'm creating. Release on Monday, behind the scenes on Tuesday, live on Wednesday, whatever. It doesn't matter. But just like that. And when you think of it like that, suddenly it doesn't feel that hard because there's a time limit on it. So you put one month and you write it down. On Monday, I'm releasing the video of this. And the video can be absolutely anything. As I said, for me, it can be, as, it can be basically any. For example, see how many of these guys in Lebanon right now are filming drone videos of Beirut and filming I don't know what and filming this and that. You just ask them, you're like, can you guys film whatever? And I put my song on top of it. You promote for me, I pr promote for you. And we upload it wherever. That's your video clip, done. Didn't cost anything. Didn't, like that's how I see it, it's that simple. Like for me, it's that simple. And the thing is, I'm not saying it to make it, I'm not downgrading the work that's been done, but the context of today has changed. It's changed completely in how you promote your music. So. Yeah, I don't know if, if you guys, what you guys think of that, but that's, uh, that's how I, I go about it. I think one, and officially, you know, it also, it's also quite a personal thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I some of my favorite artists are people who are very image aware and spend their entire, about four years crafting something and creating an image for it and posting intensely. This thing, and then disappears and it's a completely new mood it's a completely new image it's it's in line with whatever vision they have and there are other artists it's really very i mean it's very personal there are other artists that are posting their walks and their talks and their park and their kitchen and their jam session in the morning and their working file on the computer by hand it it really differs a lot and i think i don't know maybe it's because this is how i consumed music as a teenager you know uh, all the all of my all of my favorite people to listen to had very distinct visions, and this is how I still like to work. But I also it's very clear that the optics have changed, and it's it's more of a choice now than a necessity. And sometimes you're not going to keep up with it. I know we always face this issue, which is okay. We want this. We want to post things that are in line with brand identity and the image and the whole concept and everything. But it's never enough. Like there aren't, there's just, you're going to need more than you can ever make unless you're a wife, unless you're a huge artist that has the time to do it. But you're going to need more photos than you think. You're going to need more things than you think. So what Anthony is saying is that, I guess, accept, <laughs> accept the fact that it's, it's, you're going to have to figure out another way, which I'm trying, but thank you. For example, two examples. Like he said, then you disappear. Then you can really condense like your stuff and spread it out and do some behind the scenes. I think it's interesting. Actually, this is the first time I hear anyone talk about social media this way, to go like on campaigns and then take a break and then come back. I'll give you an example. Beirut Jam Sessions. We did nine weeks of live concerts, 161 artists from 25 countries. All of you guys performed there. It was super intense, whatever. And then now I just... It's vanished, boom, gone. What's happening next? And I'm just like, I'm gonna do the, the learning from it was that nine weeks was too long. That was my number one learning. Second of all was timing is absolutely everything. When, how, whatever. And what I noticed is that the four week thing is ideal. It's ideal. You have one month where you're gonna go full on, completely full on. But the thing is now, because I did nine weeks, I've kind of given myself, because of the way people perceive things, in, especially in this country and in this region, uh, it's given me a lot of leverage for the next six months. Meaning that when concerts are going to come back in two months, which is going to be the case, two small concerts at least, 
everyone is going to, most people who have venues and whatever, they're going to be like, oh, the guy at Beirut Jam Sessions, let's ask him. It's going it, to, I know it's going to happen. They're going to be like, you, you're going to come and you're going to help us and you're whatever. I'm 100% sure it's going to happen because this is what I, I've, because of the overload of content that was created on the platform and how many things that people discovered through it, now it's opened a new door. I was contacted by, by a big brand a couple of days ago and they're like, we want you to create content for us for the next six weeks, seven weeks. And I was like, if we do it, we do it four weeks only. Otherwise, there's no point. I was like, it, it makes no sense. I'm like, I would rather have four weeks of intensity where you know that for that four weeks, it's full on and then disappear and then come back with something else. And with music, it's the same. I think you guys, have, I would suggest to look at it that way. As I said, so now you have, for example, Sandra is releasing an album. Firas is releasing an album. Firas's album is a score of a movie. So the approach is, is way more different than Sandra's. But I know with Firas and with Sandra, I mean, Sandra, can you give us just a bit of insight on how, how are you promoting it at the moment? Because I'm seeing your posts everywhere. Like I'm, I'm, that's what I was saying. Like I like the fact that I can see it because now I know that when it's going to drop, whether I like it or not, I'm going to listen to it. So it's, it's super important because it's, it's, and it's, it's true. It's, I'm going to listen to it because it's there. It's present. I'm seeing it. And when the album will drop, it will be all over social media. I saw Believe shared something from you guys a few weeks ago. I saw so many different things, you know, so I'm just like there, the presence is starting to, to be there, you know? So how are you doing it at the moment? If you can give us just an idea and maybe we can pitch in Firas and I, or whoever wants to pitch in and ask questions. Um, I, I decided to release three singles before releasing the album. Uh, the thing is I released the first single a year ago with a video. Now, the difference is that I'm in the film industry as well. So a lot of people around me do things for free. So my videos don't cost as much as if it was for someone else. Um, and it has become a part of San Moon's identity. I mean, till today, people talk about the home video, the home, uh, my single home. Uh, people talk about that and people talk about you know, even old videos I, I made. So um, it, it, it's very linked. So if your your music and, and the imagery is linked, you should, you know, think about doing videos. If it's not that important, it, as you said, um, because it can get, it can get costly. Anyway, uh, so I, I released that first single a, a year ago and then the revolution started and everything you know, that was when I wanted to release the second single. And so everything shifted to January where I, I released the second single and the video. And I, I built it a bit like you said, which I, I really like your idea of making a celebration of each uh, single, of each song, of each album you release, you make a celebration of it. So that is, I, I, I released this song, uh, you know, I released, um, I, I didn't do it really that way, but now that you say it, you said it, maybe I'll do it for the next one. But Especially in the context of today where nobody can tour, because after yeah. that, then you move on to a tour or, or to, con to gigs or whatever. And when I say tour, it can even be in Lebanon, it can be in the region, it doesn't really matter, but just the performance series that follows a release that's usually, I would say, how I would go. So one month of intensity, then one month of, of the rest. But the thing is, yeah, I mean, around the period you, you release a single, uh, people start talking about it. So you reshare that, people, you know, whatever. So, it, and then you've got, you know, press and, and, and it gets on Light FM, so you can share Light FM and whatever. So yeah, it, it does last two to three weeks uh, if, if it's, if it's done properly and then um, I released a third single and I have to be honest uh, I saw I think postcards do this I saw them when they released their album they they posted vignettes for nine days until uh, the release date and so I thought 
this is a very good idea. I'm going to do the same, which I did. So since last week, I've been posting vignettes of 15 seconds of each track. Yeah. So it's not only the release day, but it's the whole thing that goes to that's, the release day. That's the content part that I was speaking about. So that's why I've, I was saying that I've been seeing Sand Moon a lot, like almost every day because of that, because the vignette is a piece of content. So if for nine days you've been doing that's nine pieces of content on Instagram that you can also put on Facebook and whatever and all the rest. And like, I think that's how it's, it, it should work in general, just like constant, uh, con even, I mean, if, we, if you're asked in your case, it's different because it's, it's, a, it's a score of a movie and uh, because it's, the visual part is the movie itself. So it's, it's completely different in the promotion, promotion side of it. So um, does anyone have any like questions or anything about that specific part? Yeah, I, I wanted to add that. Oh, sorry. Go, no, on. go ahead, please. Um, I, uh, thanks. <laughs> I wanted to say that, yeah, I agree. Like pre-release is so important. I noticed the difference between the, my first uh, debut single where I didn't do much. I was like, it was the first thing. I just dropped it and didn't want to annoy people with content and stuff. And then when the, when the second project, uh, second single came in, the one that took like a year for the video to be made, that was a blessing because I then took my time to like build content and pre-release and it was almost too spammy for me. But I think it did well because it like helped and, and the algorithms for a lot of people pre-saved. I did like two weeks of, of um, which is too long. I'm not like it's two weeks is too long. <laughs> but I did a lot of content before like teasers and stuff. And then algorithmically it pushed um, the track to be on Spotify release radar and discover weekly so i think that 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 has a lot to do with the hype that i tried to build for the track um so i'm trying to do that with the next one um so yeah i think what sand moon is doing is uh, is, uh, is pretty cool like to do teasers and stuff every day and not to worry about putting content out yeah, yeah. Um, and then someone once told me that keep pushing on your if, if it's a good track like keep pushing even after like as until your next single just randomly push your track there's no no shame like yeah. people are still sometimes singing baby hit me baby one more time like it doesn't matter when you you should always keep pushing your your product or your your stuff the rules are yeah, that's the rules have been broken like that's it there are no more rules in terms of strict rules that used to be followed in, in the music industry all that has changed because of social media so Today, when I see that there's a, I, will, I mentioned this last time as well, there was a guy who, uh, some, he's called Tiag something, I don't know what, some, I, I forgot his name, but he, he basically went from having, I think it was what, 100 followers in one year to 1.9 million followers, because he decided that in one year, he's going to post 700 times on TikTok. He put a plan in his head. He's like, I'm going to post 100, 700 times on TikTok of myself singing. And in one year, he got to 1.9 million followers, which all ended up following him elsewhere, which got him a record label deal, which got him so much like from the rest of it. So it's just about understanding that that's how it works today. The more you put, the more you get. It's as simple as it's like it with, with anything in, in, um, in the world. When you put in the work, you get the results. So, um, so is it the most extroverted artists that actually succeed then today? If you're like, even it's not only it doesn't it's not only artists. It's not only related to artists. It's not and it's not extroverted. It's just being present, because if you're if you're if today you aren't present on social media or you aren't present in some way in the digital world, then in the professional world people aren't going to come for you and they're not going to find you. It's it's I think of I think of movie makers as well. A lot of movie makers who are just like, you know we're directors, we're never going to do anything, we're going to drop a movie. No one is Quentin Tarantino from the independent artists, independent movie makers. Like it takes time to reach that level. And there's a different ball game that happened 30 years ago versus today. So today you want to be out there, you have to be out there to the point that everyone can find you. If they can't find you, there's a problem. Like whether it's music or it's professional or whatever. And it's, it's your fault if they can't find you. Like, in Sand Moon's case, if you Google Sand Moon, we're finding you and we're finding your music. You know what I mean? 
if someone can't find you on Google, there's a problem. Like there's a big problem that you have to fix. That's why when bands choose their name, I always tell them Google it first. Because if you can't find it, you're gonna, if, you're, if your band name is John Smith or your artist name, you're in trouble because there's like 70, it, there's 70,000 John Smiths or in Lebanon, the equivalent of uh, Elias Khoury. Like you don't have an Elias Khoury who's gonna be a, a massive artist because it's the most common name in the country. So it really, like you have to really like think of little details, details like this. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's when it comes to promotion, the promotion part. Uh, Gerard, do you have anything to say? I've been seeing you, I've been looking at you and waiting for you to, to interrupt us. Uh, not, not really, I kind of relate to everything that you're saying. But just a small point, maybe I think um, a musicians or a band or an artist, uh, it's like, you, everyone needs to relate to to the brand these days uh, and they need to get to you know to know you more as an individual so in a, once you want to grow your your uh, loyal fan base uh, the people that do relate to your music they need to know more about you so feeding them content uh, consistently uh, not only on releases on this stuff nowadays I think it's uh, it's uh, it's like it's like uh, the accessibility of information about the artist himself is really important for the for the audience, uh, especially from the matter of like um, the indie artists or the people that are uh, a bit in the background and they need to go a bit to the foreground. So that's what I think about uh, content and uh, artists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think it's also just attaching stories, having a story. Even if it's a simple story to, to anything, you know, even if it's like, even for this, for this soundtrack that I'm doing, which is, it's completely dictated by a vision of a director. You know, when, you, when you're doing a score, you're supporting the vision of a director who's another artist. And, but even then I thought it was very important that every track had my version of a story to tell, to tag on so people can have something to comment on you know it's just the the nicest thing about social media is when people send you comments i guess good good ones so uh, uh giving people something to react to is quite important for me at least i found it much more uh, satisfying that you know this is okay listen here but whatever this is a new track but there's also a little bit of text that gives a little bit of some context about why it was done or how it was done or what it's what it's about even if it's a, a you know even if it's something as simple as this was a challenge to make in three days or this was the, you know i had to learn how to program something to do this or i had to learn how to play a cello to do this like even if it's just something very personal and doesn't have to be a plot that has three acts and a character dies and, you know, it doesn't have to be that kind of story. It just has to be something that somebody can say, oh my God, you know, my cello is my favorite instrument or, oh, wow, I've never been able to write a song in less than five days or just something where somebody can have enough information to put, uh, you know, relate to it and put their part of life into, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Um, if anyone has any questions related to promotion, just before we move on to just, one last point, which is ideas. To Can make. I ask Firat something? Yeah, go on. Hi, Firat. Uh, Hi. I've been trying to go into film scoring. It's been two, two years. Uh, I, I did two short movies, some ads. Any advice how to promote myself as a film scorer, not just an artist? How to, to be able to reach movie producers, to be able to reach uh, advertising uh, agencies? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it, in terms of, you know, uh, branding yourself as film scoring, it has, it has a lot to do, I think, with um, connecting with directors. Because even for me, even when I tried to do this whole thing of going to an agency and telling them, look, I have amazing work, or I think I have amazing work, it's, they, it's always like, yeah, yeah, of course, next time we have a project, we'll be in there. But a lot of it is... is um, 
getting through to directors and having a good conversation with directors. And a lot of it is really studying film scoring, which is a very complicated uh, type of music making. And it's completely different than writing a song or writing, you know, something that has a, a beat and a chorus and a verse. And it's something that is much more, it's a different beast and it's a lot of music. So for this 15, for this 10 minute short film uh, uh, that I'm doing, I have 12 minutes of music, which is crazy. You know, it's more than the footage. So it's a completely different thing. And it's, a, it's the approach has to be very different. I tend to work very good, well with directors. And I think the other thing is also um, learning a lot of, it's very technical, you know, you have to be able to arrange, you have to understand uh, that when you're, when you're a film scorer, you can't be, unless you're somebody that has a very unique vision and has gotten far because of it, you have to adapt a lot. You have to be able to write, whether it's orchestral stuff or acoustic stuff or more action styles cues or more dramatic cues you have to be very versatile and this means having knowledge over the technique of of composing and arranging and the you know the range and the way that you can use an orchestra or whether it, it's it's sometimes it's three musicians and always do live my other my other advice would be even if you're getting paid a couple of hundred dollars spend that on live musicians and support it with VSTs or you know plugins and stuff like that. Always have live things. I've never ever been able to create something out of of, of digital things that sounds convincing. I've, I've never been able to do it. So always put, even if it's a solo player, even if you have a you're trying to build an orchestra of a hundred people, get one good violin player or one good exactly. horn player or one good trumpet player or whatever your main thing is or whether it's percussion, sometimes it's just having a drummer or somebody banging on something in a studio, you feel reality and exactly. software will never work. So I, I would say always get something live in there and, and understand, I mean, for me, I don't know, I'm a bit of a, you know, architect uh, uh, mindset, which is get all the books about it and read them all and figure it out from there, which is, which is not the best way to do it, but it's not a wrong way to do it either. Uh, YouTube is one of my best friends for these things. Um, there are lots of amazing composers and amazing uh, people who love sharing. You know, there's Junkie XL, who's a, who's a very, like, he, he, he was DJ, he's a Dutch DJ that ended up being one of the biggest film scorers of the past 10 years. There's uh, the people from Spitfire Audio who are actually, uh, they're a VST company, they're, they're a sampling company. Yeah, I know. And uh, Christian Hansen, one of the founders, just does weekly videos about the music industry, about scoring, about being a one-man studio, which is what he is, you know, how to arrange, how to be ready, how to hit your deadlines. Because it, when you're doing film music, those things become very important because you're just a cog. You're, you're not leading a vision. Nobody cares about uh, uh, the amazing cello line that you wrote. The producer wants to put it on the film and get the film released so meeting deadlines and being very meticulous and having a very clear and structured system becomes very very important sorry but that's Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Beth, can i ask what your background is in uh, music wise so you're you're self-taught for, for yes, I, I i started playing guitar when i was 12 years old uh 20 years ago and um played guitar for about 10 years or eight years before I started writing music. And I started writing music with Mashiro Aleda. This was the first experience of writing music. And uh, I can't sing. So that's, that's something that I was very obvious, but very obvious to me. And I had to learn, um, I had to learn piano to be able to have accompaniment and have some kind of melodic thinking uh, at the same time with two hands because I, I can play a guitar, but it's very hard to strum and play, a, 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 you know, a top line or something with that. So from piano, the world opened up a little bit in terms of electronics. And I really like learning instruments. So, so for like a project that I did last year, I borrowed a cello and forced myself to learn a little bit of cello, you know, borrowed a clarinet. I, I think, I mean, this is a very personal thing for me. It's, um, 
I always tell people who ask me for advice to learn how to play percussion. If you can't play percussion well, you're going to have a lot of difficulties in a lot of places, whether it's in the studio or live. Get to choose a thing, even if it's a shaker, choose a thing and learn how to shake well. This is, this is one thing that I always like to tell people was a big help for me. And the second thing is know your software. Like the amount of help you can get from um, having things like Ableton Live or Logic Pro or whatever you work on, if you know the ins and outs of these things, um, you'll be able to, first of all, communicate better with people because the standard of people listening, you know, 20 years ago, you could sit down with a director or sit down with a bandmate and play them something on the piano and they would have to imagine. Now, nobody wants to imagine anything. You can, you can make it. Everything is there. So the expectations of people, whether it's in the film industry or whether it's other bandmates or whether it's demo stage, like your demo has to be good enough to impress people on a very, very high level. So learn the software, um, be kind of, understand how it can make things easier, but also know how it could make things uh, dumb. Because at the end of the day, it is loops and it is, it dehumanizes in a lot of ways, but there are easy fixes for that. Getting a live musician is easy fix for that. Singing is a very easy fix for that. For me, the second I hear uh, a vocal, the humanity and the tenderness and the reality of something is directly there. And even if it's a five minute loop, if the singing is good enough for me, I don't really care. But yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I remembered a challenge that I might be facing um, and my next release that I wanted to like, just see if you guys can throw in ideas. Um, so last single Google ads helped a lot, like a uh, YouTube ads, sorry, like skip ads. Um, but this one, uh, there's a rapper on it. It's a collaborative project. So he says, um, music synthesize, drugs hypnotize. So the mention of the word drugs is freaking me out because you know how Google is. It'll just like put up you know, drug information, whatever warning and wouldn't run the ads. So I was thinking, of course, I could take that budget and put it into Facebook and Instagram. But it's also not this, I don't know. I, I would actually Facebook would be just a thumbnail. So I don't think people would even click it. So maybe more Instagram. I think with, if you're going to put the title, uh, you're, you're worried about the title that you're going to put of the song, right? So it's going to have- No, no, the title, the title is Be All Right, it's fine. But in the song, there's a line that says drugs hypnotize. So they might have an issue with that, I don't know. Uh, they won't even catch it as long as they, they, the system of Google and most of social media doesn't catch things midway unless it's violence, unless it's actual violence where there's blood and there's killing and there's whatever, but it doesn't get, like you could put a song, I mean, that's what, I mean, unless you're gonna have a song that's gonna get 10 million hits, I mean, then it won't even, it won't, it won't really catch anything, but drugs hypnotize, uh, Dr. Dre, every, every song of Dr. Dre talked about drugs and. <laughs> I know, but did he market it on Dre. Oh, that Dr. Dre. His, his but if the, the, the Beirut Jam, um, like live from home, I posted it on YouTube and, and then I got like shocking content and whatever. And that's like on their end, I keep that. Found them but it, uh, I just don't want that to be done to the release. Hmm? It stayed on YouTube, didn't it? Or? Yeah, it stays. But I mean, you can't market it is what I'm trying to say. Like I can't you push market, it. Market it elsewhere. Like if it won't give a problem, I'm sure. I'm sure it won't. But if it's the case, then just market it elsewhere. Like, where? And where would you suggest like, I focus that um, budget? Should it be more on, where do you think people would react where, to it more? Where do you think people, for you, for your followers, where are they most active? Wherever they're most active, feed that. Like, if it's okay. I, have, I have some experience with this yeah, because uh, one of our videos, but it's a bit different, but I understand the concern. Because one of our videos had soldiers in it and uh, scenes of like tanks and violence. And mm -hmm. this, this flagged uh, YouTube's censorship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if you do it ahead, if you, do it, if you do it in advance enough, you can get the warning and you can contest the warning and you can communicate with, with Google. Just make sure mm -hmm. you do it like at least a week before release. 
so that they have time to, to put everything up on there, run the test, even if it's, even if the ad runs, uh, uh, I mean, even if you waste $10 or whatever it is, because the ad needs to run for them to actually start uh, the process. Mm. But even if you do that, it's still better knowing in advance than, you know, a few hours before release or after release, finding out that, okay, I need to contest this whole thing. And you've lost the first three days of your, of your stream, which are the kind of the Mo most, the most yeah, important. But so my drop is on Vivo, so that's the problem. It's going to be through uh, the distributor. Okay. Like, I can't even go. Marketing. Oh, then tell the, I mean, they're marketing. doing the marketing on YouTube. They're, do, they're doing the marketing on Google Ads or AdSense or whatever it is, no? Probably. I, I'm doing the marketing, but I mean, the video, I don't have access to the back end of the video until it uh, drops. So that's what, yeah, that's what I mean. Mm. But, it's, but maybe you can upload, upload the track with a, I mean, it's a hidden track. Upload a hidden track with a thumbnail or whatever that nobody mm. sees. Do the marketing exercise on that if you can. Just Actually, to see. I can do that on the preview link, yeah. Yeah, just to see if it might trigger a content warning or an ad mm. thing. Unlisted video. Cool. Upload it unlisted so nobody can see it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I have the preview link for bloggers or heck on there, so I'll I'll do that. Cool. That's a good idea. Thanks. <laughs> Um, all right, we still, have, we still have 10 more minutes. I don't know if you guys want to go just quickly through some ideas of how to make money while this is happening because I have, I have a few ideas of during because point is there if countries like Italy are opening up in a couple of weeks, which is official by the way, for concerts up to 200 people, then I think we're, we're looking at a, a much quicker return for live music than we realize. Um, I think there'll be limits in terms of how and what and where. And the reason I bring up live music because it's the only proper way to make revenue from, for, for artists. Um, other ideas during lockdown or if lockdown continues or well, there's not really a lockdown anymore. It's kind of leaned off everywhere. But uh, one of the, the big things that I kind of support is doing actual concerts on zoom and i think uh to get to get your audience to, to be involved with you on zoom so one of the things i figured out because with the beirut jam sessions instagram festival i was trying at some point to put a fund so that i could pay the artist and then i realized it's unbelievably impossible because of lebanon and the banking crisis or whatever but the loophole behind that was uh to put a ticket on Ehjoz. So if you put a ticket on Ehjoz and you tell people I'm performing for 20 minutes and the ticket is $10 and you get 50 of your friends to show up watching you play for $10 at home uh, or 50 followers or whatever, then there's your good, a good 500 bucks that you've made out of nothing because Ehjoz can transfer money and so on. So that's one idea. Another idea is I'm a, I'm a big like, supporter of people who put music on Bandcamp because Bandcamp is one of the only platforms that gives 85% of the revenue back to the artist. So I think that's also one idea to consider. There is the Spotify support your artist thing that Anahami have started doing as well, but that doesn't really solve the problem because I think it's kind of like as if you had a broken leg and someone gave you a plaster, it's just going to like do nothing. It's just like, it's not really solving a problem. And I think, especially for streaming, for streaming platforms, which where the artists don't really make much money, it kind of is like, you know, it's not, it's not solving the problem of how to make money. Um, and then I think also most of you, which I've mentioned previously, is uh, most of you have a talent in some way. And whether it's you're a musician, whether you're a singer, whether you're whatever, and I think a lot of people are willing to pay a lot of silly money right now to do that, uh, to learn online. And last week we had, we had one artist who was saying that he, he did that, he put a call on his Instagram, he got one artist, he, one person to perform, he taught, him, he taught them how to play guitar and he's not even a self, like he's a self-taught guitarist, so he's not a professional guitar, guitar teacher. And he was saying the following week he got seven are seven people who signed up for his classes and the week after more and so on and so forth. 
So that's something to consider. You can teach vocal singing, you can teach um, whatever it is. Another one is Patreon. Patre I don't know if you guys know of Patreon. Patreon is basically, you can tell people, okay, I'm gonna, whatever, you come up with an idea. I'm gonna release a special edition acoustic version dedicated to you if you pay $5 or whatever. It's not in our culture to do that, but Patreon is killing it elsewhere. And um, yeah, there's the eventuality, which is you can start putting, I think right now, if I told you to play a concert to 10 people in a house and each person chipped in with a small amount, I don't think anyone would say no to that right now, even if it's completely unplugged. So I think house concerts are gonna be a thing for emerging artists uh, very soon. And uh, yeah, those are just some quick ideas. If you have any, any like thoughts mm -hmm. on I, 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 I was thinking about the Patreon thing. I'm a big fan of Patreon. That Patreon is a bit of a technical, it, there's a lot of, the things I like are usually technical things, like people who are, I don't know, doing woodworking or something weird like that. But I also thought maybe like something good could be working sessions, like streaming working sessions on Patreon. Because for a lot of people, that's a big mystery. How, how musicians work is a big mystery. Some people like to keep it a mystery. I don't really care of keeping it a mystery. So I was thinking that, that it could be nice to have um, like streamed working sessions, how, you know, coming up with an idea or developing an idea or doing takes and trials for a vocal line or things like that, that could be a part of a Patreon package because it's a subscription thing, you know, people subscribe and they're given access to something that people are not usually given access to. Yeah. And so something like that could be very simple and, and very useful. I'm sure for some people, because I was looking also at before, there's an issue of uh, money from outside and whatever. I think all of us know people who are outside of Lebanon who might have a, a pay, they can create a PayPal account that just needs an email address and a, and a home post or a post, postcode in any European country. And uh, you can then transfer the money to them and then they transfer it to you and whatever. So that's easy ways to get around uh, the Patreon, the Patreon thing. And um, yeah, I think that the, the thing is live concerts are coming back soon. So uh, yeah, I mean, there's one thing as well, which I don't know, we haven't mentioned really, but if you have released music, get it registered, like do that as soon as you can. Just, I don't know, SASM, PRS, Centric, whatever thing you prefer get it registered it helps actually it's not a bit of a headache for them for, for artists in general but there are easy ones there was one i, I mentioned before which is called sound reef sound reef is italian you just upload the music onto them you sign it virtually and it's done and you've protected yourself worldwide for, for the music so um there's a lot of that that uh, that also also works. there's also copyright.gov yeah for example, use that all the time. Yeah, but that's, I mean, I'm, I'm more about registering, I mean, registration with collection agencies that can monitor, you know, plays or whatever usages or whatever things. And these things, these things actually, like they, they become not insignificant with time. And the earlier on you do it, the better, because even though it is retroactive, it takes a lot of time for people to for these collection agencies to go through it and sift through it and do things like that. I mean, it's just a, it's just good practice for me. It's just good practice. Once you release, make sure that it's registered. It's on where it needs to be. Yeah. Um, I don't know the question of making, make like having some kind of income or revenue stream during these times is very tricky. I don't think it's com completely cracked yet. Um, it's, it's weird also for me personally to do, to think of like doing, asking people for a significant amount of money, unless it's charitable. Yeah, so yeah. unless 80% of this is going to charity and the ticket is $20, then sure. Because the, you know, there are kind of bigger concerns and, and the, the idea is that you can't be tone deaf as well. You have to understand the situation, which is important. Um, but I do agree that, that um, con like concerts at a distance can be a thing. I was thinking of doing uh, listening parties, which is more than, it's not just live music, but it's more of a, 
live like radio show, like a listening party for an hour, an hour and a half of with some commentary, some music that I've been listening to or, you know, has been interesting me or inspiring me or things that I've been working on. So I don't know. I, it's just hard also to, to think of replacing live music, which is a yeah, big music. hole. It's a big hole to fill, you know. <laughs> There are temporary fixes anyway. It's just, it's going to come back. Uh, I mean, there's, there's many festivals that have, I mean, even a massive festival like Exit Festival is going ahead. You know, there's so many festivals that are going ahead. So it's going to come back relatively quick uh, because the virus is going to be here like, uh, like any other virus, like Ebola, like whatever. It's here to stay. It's not going to vanish from the earth, but uh, it's going to be contained and, and handled differently. So, um, so yeah, I think I think about, it's just those those stuff I mentioned are fixes for if you need to somehow yeah. make some con some some sort of income now, then uh, then yeah, let's uh, let's do that. Um, I, think, uh, I have maybe. a question. Yeah, yeah go go, go on. Uh, last week you said about the PayPal, so I checked. I asked about it. Um, but the question that was raised was whether uh, they told me that they cannot retrieve the money to wire it or send it by Western Union or they send it, it to, send it to their account to their bank account and from their bank account they send it to you. Ah, uh, okay. That's okay. what I used to do before when I used to I used to need PayPal. I would send it to a bank account to a fr of a friend of mine in France, and then he would send it back to me to me here. So when it's PayPal, that's that's how it works. So I and mean, we all know different people in abroad. So that's pretty easy. Gerard, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, from the perspective of uh, how to monetize more uh, in this uh, phase, I think uh, first of all, I think the, there's a loophole on all of this live performance thing where we can, uh, where the musician does not relate to the to his audience and vice versa. So this uh, thing is, uh, you know. Online thing have, has been happening for, for the past, I don't know, for me, for the past 15 years, I've discovered a lot of artists on KXP, Dying Desk on, and this stuff. And you always see like a small group of people watching the small band in a more intimate um, scenario setting. Uh, and I think uh, seeing this as a viewer from home as well, you can, you can feel how this artist is, ex is ex expressing himself and how this audience is receiving this message. So I think um, uh, if you can, uh, like, like you said, maybe you can do a small uh, listening session or, or, or shoot in a way or uh, to tell this whole experience because what people are looking for is an experience rather yeah. than uh, just like sitting down at home or watching something. And maybe from the matter of monetization, um, if you're releasing uh, an album or, uh, or um, I don't know, maybe you can send some, invest in some promotion material like a vinyl or a t-shirt or I don't know, something that relates to your message. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I want to test this idea actually. And um, I think it, uh, you can do a, some, a bit of revenue. For example, like, I don't know in which year, Nine, nine Inch Nails, uh, so I did the master's in something called research for design and innovation. And mostly how we perceive stuff is like I'm a service designer. So um, we studied something in the master's where we, uh, we had a, 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 a workshop about momentum zero, which is if it's your first thing or you're trying to amplify your message, if you choose the right people to amplify this message, for example, some people that a friend or or people that do have some followers that they can tell that this event is happening so instead of having 100 or 50 friends watching you you may have 150 so um, this is from one perspective and from another perspective like um, nine inch nails and i don't know in which year in 1990 something they decided to release their album without a record label because uh, there was like some money deal and uh, they could have made like around, for example, $5 million. But when they released their, their album, they also sent promotional material like, uh, I don't know, a package you can buy for $20 and you can have the album for free. So they did around $30 million because they just extended the, their, their message for free. And if you want more, you can buy this thing. So um, 
there's a lot of ideas of how you can monetize uh, nowadays. Uh, but I think the most important thing is people to relate to this experience somehow to a, 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 a promotion material or a certain message or something customized for you to be there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, to give them something additional. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just giving the example of the, the Zoom idea. I mean, just imagine, let's say you, you want to put together a Zoom concert. There's a Zoom link. To get the Zoom link, people have to pay $10 on Ehjos, which is Lebanese, so it works fine. They pay it. You get 50 people or 100 people or whatever. You're, as you will be the host of it, you can put everyone on mute all the time so no one speaks. You put yourself, you play, they watch you. They have a good time. They've contributed to their friend. And, you know, that's, that's an idea. Then what you can do afterwards is you can send, you can keep the email of each person. I'm talking virtually now because sending things, yeah, yeah. you can send them like a special uh, poster or something digital, anything digital. Sure. Valuable, you know? yeah. yeah there's also there's a there's a very good website called everpress it's a british uh, it's a british company that does merch but it's pre-order merch so you don't there's no upfront cost which is sometimes a prohibit it's, it's a prohibitive cost for a lot of artists so basically you can upload a design and um, they they take in pre-orders and let's say you get 30 pre-orders then they print and ship them to quantity and you get a certain amount of, of money back. So there's no, should I print 100, should I print 200? Does it work in Lebanon? They ship worldwide. So, I mean, under the current circumstances, I don't know exactly, but they do ship worldwide. And it's a very, it's a very popular store for that reason, because a lot of artists do like uh, special edition things on pre-order um, and things like that. Because also, you know how it is, it's cost, cost of merch is scalable. So yeah. printing a hundred shirts is not as cost effective as printing a thousand shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with this, they kind of just remove that hassle from the artist and they give you just the ability to design and upload the design and choose a cotton, choose a cut, choose this. Everpress, it's pretty cool as well. Like, yeah, I like it. Cool, 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 cool. Anthony? Yeah. Um, for me, the, the, the emergence of, uh, of, of the indie scene in Lebanon was very, very strong around 2012 till 16, 17, when all of you like Beirut Jam Session, Beirut Open Stage, Red Bull, though they never supported me, but the others did. <laughs> um, who else, you know, uh, certain festivals, Jim Beam, blah, blah, blah. They were all there and you could see something happening at that moment and a lot of bands came out at that moment mm. and then and it, it it excited bands to, to to you know perform better and because they had a plat platforms to 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 expose themselves locally at least and it suddenly kind of disappeared yeah Something needs to be done. Well, no, so, something will be done. Like it's not something, it's something, it has to happen. It's not, I mean, whether it's from my side personally or others, I know something, put it this way, I've never been more excited about <laughs> what's going to happen for Beirut's music scene than in the next 12 months. To be so honest. you know things that we don't. I don't, <laughs> that we don't, I don't know things that you don't. It's that I've now seen a hunger in the musicians that disappeared in the past few years. That disappeared as well. The hunger disappeared in the musicians, the hunger disappeared in the promoters, the hunger disappeared yeah. in the venues. It became a game of if you're playing at a massive venue and there aren't any massive venues here other than Grand Factory or whatever, then you've made it. And that is kind of like no longer relevant today in Lebanon with the current yeah. Today, any musician, any band will happily take playing in front of 20 or 30 people and doing that 10 times a month, they would all say yes. So I think that there's going to be an, a different wave that's going to come out. I've, I've discovered, thanks to the Instagram thing, a whole new wave of artists that I'd never discovered before. I've been sent so much music and I now know that it's also the responsibility of promoters like myself and hopefully others 
to kind of lead the way and you know guide 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 them i mean there's many festivals whether it's wicker park whether it sounds good whether it's you know there's many festivals out there that are upcoming doing their stuff and there will be more you know the thing is as opposed to before there's a feeling i think with between the revolution and you know this this period of the virus and whatever there's a feeling that people want when well, they want new stuff you know they want to discover new things and they're more i think they'll be more open to it if promotion is done right by whoever is organizing and whatever. I personally, I feel very much more confident than like the last concert I organized was of a Jordanian band, Echir Zafir. And I was so not confident about it that I had, to, I'd never done this before, but I had, I mean, the last time I did this was the first concert I organized in 2012. I had to send individual messages to people, to friends, to beg them to buy tickets just so that I don't lose money. And I still lost a lot of money. And I was so, I lost so much confidence because of that, that I was just like, you know, like, what's the point? But then it was, it was literally three days before the revolution. And then I saw what happened then. I saw so many, like this whole unity in the country and whatever, for better or for worse. I've seen now with this, this Instagram thing, I've seen an emergence of new artists. I've been re so many artists have reached out to me more than in any time since I've worked, I've been working in the music scene or industry. And now I just feel that, you know, it's a time for new, new platforms to emerge, new, uh, new, new things. And I, I, I'm more confident than, than I was six months ago, to be completely honest. And I think that there's going to be a very, very, very big wave of, yeah, I mean, it's already happening now that most music stations, most radio stations have shut down, most places have shut down. Something is going to come and stand. It's, it's, up to, it's up to the local initiatives to do it. Yeah. And this is, it's going to happen. It's going to happen whether we like it or not. And I, I'm, I can see it like so clearly that it's going to happen. There's no festivals this summer. Radio stations. What about Sounds Good? I don't know if they're doing yeah. it. Yeah. Are you guys doing the festival this year, Gerard? Sounds good? No. Yeah. No. no there's no festival. People would come here, would do it. But I don't think so. There's so many things that are disappearing for the next few months. The thing is, after that, when we finally understood what are the limitations of, you know, you know like whatever, you know, in terms of crowds and so on, you're going to see a, a big resurgence. I can, I'm, I'm so confident yeah. of this I, in every possible way. I have a question. Um, I hope it doesn't take us too much over, but my question is um, over time, Ozdi. Um, so, Sandra, you were saying around like 2016, 2017, that's where, the, that's the end kind of bracket for this fire in the music scene. Around that time, which, which, which I see, I agree. Um, because there was a dwindling in audiences as well, and it became this thing of same audiences going to the same artists, and it was just a cycle. And um, talks of a resurgence and a reemergence of the music scene, definitely there's a thirst and a hunger. My question is, at what point does the music scene become, given Lebanon is a small country, but at what point does the music scene become a music industry that artists can thrive through, audiences can find new? artists and i mean in this it, there is a there is an industry here but it's not it's not for the independent artists it's not for independent mm -hmm. initiatives it, it exists you know the, the nancy ajrams and elisa's and all these guys they exist and they're thriving yeah. in their own market and in their own way uh, it's not what we might listen to but there's a, a whole lot of people that listen to this and um i think having an industry as an industry per se you need you know, bigger mach big machines in terms of uh, labels, in terms of, uh, you know, TV channels, uh, holding, holding a fort with artists and startups and whatever. Like, it's, you can name, you know, little bits and pieces there. And personally, I think there's something happening and it's going to happen again. And as you said, I mean, um, I saw from Beirut Jam Sessions and with Biblos Festival, I saw a big dip in, in attendances in all, all concerts since 2016. So 16, 17, 18, 19. So we're talking about four years of gradual drop. And um, 
this can be accounted to many things. Um, we could, that would be for another time as well. But um, but I think there's something something new is happening, and I'm I'm very 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 like super super excited about uh, about what's gonna come. Like it's just a matter of we have a few a few months ahead that are gonna be difficult, but then it's gonna be it's gonna. Be I, I just if I can add something to Riwa's question, I don't think that any like the size. It's just a question of numbers for me. Lebanon is not a large enough place to allow a music industry to, to happen. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's very hard. And I can tell you for a fact that, for instance, if Mashrua Leila had not opened the door into Egypt and Jordan and other countries in the Arab world, it would have finished in a couple of years. Like, there's no question about it. The way um, I, I, always, I always believe just, okay, let, let's just, I'll, I'll just say this and then I think because we have just a few more yeah. minutes. Uh, the way I look at it, and I hope you can perceive it the same way, I look at Lebanon as a city within a country and the country is the Middle East. That's yeah. how I look at it. Those are the countries where we have free access to in terms of passport and whatever, and we should use that to our advantage. Like it's the, one of the biggest markets in the world and there's a huge potential from the UAE all the way to Egypt, the whole, the whole Middle East and North Africa. It's a playground that we haven't properly explored and it's cheap to get there and whatever. We're a tiny city within that ecosystem. And if we look at it from that way and not put the weight of, you know, Lebanon, 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 then Guys, I think we should end it here. I'll just ask you guys to give a, a nice little smile so I can take a screenshot of, of this. Uh, and uh, how, how do you do that? Reactions. You have to go to reactions. You have to be reactionary. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, guys. Um, if thank you, have, you. I, I recorded this, so I'm going to upload it. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate at all. I can help you guys with whatever you want. And Firas, I'm sure, will too. So thank awesome. you so much again. And uh, Thank you. Have a good night, thank everybody. You. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to connect with people on here. So I don't know if you guys, if, uh, if it's not a stretch to like, you know, to uh, know, you know, people's yeah. handles and stuff. Everyone at the end. And then you, when I share the link of this, it's with an email to everyone. And then you guys can connect with whoever you want. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.